So the first thing I want to talk about is, as Oz mentioned, I'm currently the product senior product manager at Redis Labs for security. Um, but as he said before, this is an independent group, so I'm actually going to do as much as possible not to talk about Redis. And when I do so, I'm only going to do it in the context of our open source product. So just keep that in mind. This isn't a sales pitch. I want to talk more generally about database security trends and what I see in the marketplace. So first, who am I? I'm a CISP. Um, that, as everyone knows, that's our badge of pride and honor and shame. Um, we all say that because it's a mile wide and an inch deep. I work as a, a consultant at the Center for Internet Security. Um, do a lot of work in the open source community. And as I said, I'm uh, the product manager for security at Redis Labs. Um, and Redis is an open source database product, really well known as a, a cache in the industry. Um, you can follow me on I am a teapot 418 that's GitHub, Twitter, and shoot me an email if you have any questions about databases in general or security in general. I'm always ha happy to talk. So when you look at the database market, this is probably what you think. And this is what I hear every day. As a, as a product manager for security, I talk every day about database security. And this is the trend that I always hear. When you think of access controls within a database, you think of your query restrictions and your command restrictions, how you have access controls to specific amounts of data. Uh, are you masking your data in test? Uh, is there a separation of duties baked into your access control? And every security control in the database realm comes with trade-offs. So in the instance of access controls, this is the trade-off of complexity. We also have encryption that's on everyone's mind. And this is kind of a standard thing throughout any product. So in the database world, we have encryption in transit, the configuration of Cypher suites and protocols. We are also frequently asked about encryption at rest. And uh, I, as a product manager at Redis Labs, or, which is an in-memory database, am specifically asked about encryption in use very frequently. And to solve the problem of encryption at use, there's the aspect of client-side encryption that can be implemented. And also, as the, the group from Azure and Fortanix talked about the other week, um, secure enclaves are a technology that I, I'm personally really excited about. But the trade-off with encryption is uh, performance. Now, CPUs in the marketplace today have made this performance impact neg negligible, but it's still something to consider. And auditing is the next thing that comes up to mind when people think about databases. So is there administrative auditing? Uh, are you logging to syslog? Um, are you using database activity monitoring? And the two major vendors in that marketplace are IBM Guardian and Imperva's database activity monitoring. And also database vulnerability scanning, which are also dominated mainly by those two vendors. And uh, what I see is that the, these adoptions are, these security controls are looked at in CIS benchmarks, um, when you do compliance controls like PCI and HIPAA, and specifically database vulnerability scanning is actually a, a requirement of FedRAMP. So how is the database realm changing? Because when you look at this screen here, you're seeing the traditional on-premise security toolkit. But the database world isn't on-premise anymore. Um, now, that's not to say it isn't completely on it isn't on-premise anymore, um, but we see more and more people moving to the cloud. So right now, the database market is increasing drastically with complexity, and the security space faces a lot of new challenges. So there's a really large and diverse set of database solutions in the marketplace today. And we're going from a world where databases are standard to most part, on the, for the most part, to where databases now are forced to solve multiple use cases. So what you'll see is that there's now a database for streaming, a database for caching, a database for um, agile workflows, your traditional relational database. And all of this ecosystem now needs to fit together somehow. And to add on top of that, 
there's a great cloud migration happening in the Fortune 500. And as everyone moves to the cloud, you're seeing more database as a service. And whether that be cloud native or with individual vendors hosting their own database as a service, um, the end result is that we see more complexity. So as you look at the database market today, this is the most popular databases on the market according to Stack Overflow. Um, you see Oracle still dominates um, MySQL, the open source version, um, SQL Server and Postgres, your re relational databases are still on top. Um, but what you're seeing is a huge compounding annual for your non-relational databases. So you see Elasticsearch, Redis, uh, Cassandra, even Splunk on here, and DynamoDB. So all of this is, is really evolving. And you see over 100 databases in the marketplace today. And as security professionals, complexity is the enemy of security. That's something that I, I firmly believe. But the database market has filled so many niche use cases that deliver business value that we're not going to get away from that complexity anytime soon. So us as security professionals need to come together to solve this. So today I want to talk about how we as a community, one, what we should be thinking about, and two, what we might be able to do to solve that. So complexities happened. There's now a, a database for every microservice that we've developed. And as long as assuming that that microservice is following best practices. But what can we do? So we're probably can ask some of the same questions. So on screen, you can see uh, a secure MongoDB TLS configuration. You can see that Mongo requires TLS on screen here. Um, you can see that it has a certificate file, it's encrypted, it's disabling its TLS protocols that are generally considered insecure, and you can even set up your cipher suites. And that's the same in many database and many database leaders in the market today. So that's not changing anytime soon. And access control lists are also the same. So it, as you can see on screen, the, here's a MongoDB example. Um, if you're familiar with MongoDB, MongoDB um, organizes its data based on databases and collections. A, a database is a, equivalently a database, and the collection is a, a group or a table. And you can also see Redis here. And, and Redis is best known as a caching server um, however, it also can act as a primary database. And you can see here uh, that because Redis is a key value store, it is configuring access control list via a glob style wildcard and the commands that it's able to use. So I want to show you a quick demo of access control lists, at least in the NoSQL space using Redis. Um, and I'll show other databases in the market in a second. So this is a, a, a Redis command line prompt I've already authenticated. And you can see here I have a couple of users on this actual database. So I'm authenticated as a specific user. So, and I'm the default user. So the default user, as you can see in, in this list, has all access. I haven't disabled it. Um, but let me go through and authenticate as an admin or as a service account user. Actually, first let me show you the database we have. So as a, as a user of Redis, what you're seeing here is a key value store. So when you design keys, you design them based on namespaces. So if I were to say, take a JavaScript file or a JSON file. You have your object, your overall key, and your value. So this is an object, a key, and a value here. And in Redis, you also can use a namespace in your key design name. And the key design name is entirely flexible. 
Um, but if I were to go off to a service account here, let's uh, let's just off to service account two. Of course, this is what I get for not specifically knowing. Um, but what you can see here is that. Hold on. I have totally forgotten what my users' passwords are. Okay. So now I'm in as a service account user. And you can see here this in my ACL list, this user has specific access credentials. So the service count two user doesn't have access to any commands except set and get and can only access top secret keys with within that namespace. So if I were to do age get, you can see I'm not able to access this because I don't have access to this command. And I think as a whole, the database market is not going to change with access control lists. Um, I use Redis here as a, a primary example. And you can see here, Mongo is configuring its at role based on a product, at, which is the database name and an inventory. So this user within Mongo within this role is given access to the find command, the update command, and the insert command, and only able to access data within the inventory collection, which exists in the product database. Because the database market is has changed so much, we have to ask ourselves, what do we have to think about differently? So I think we have to do four things. First, we have to ask ourselves different questions than we're used to asking. We have to think about distributed system protection, and we have to think about distributed system availability. What you'll see in the database market is that many times we're using clustering, which is very different than your traditional database that doesn't have a full cluster. And the other thing I think we need to do is watch and support the security trends in the market. So what are the things that need to change? Well, first, ask ourselves different questions. So today, we always talk about SQL injection and no SQL injection. But what if I told you that the concept of SQL injection as a whole doesn't exist? Now, that's not to say no SQL databases don't have injection. They do. So on screen here, you can see an example of a, a SQL injection statement. This would be a, a standard SQL statement here where you use the username and a password. And if I wanted to inject, I would simply add a, a colon, do or one equals one, and then comment out the rest of the command. In MongoDB, I want to show you a, a more classic example of NoSQL injection. NoSQL injection is very different. And you can see here, what we're doing is we're taking a password, and rather than using the password, we're passing in a, a command comparison. And the comparison operator star GT that you can see on screen is, is really a greater than. So I, I want to give you a bit of a demo around MongoDB injection and why, why it's possible to do and what we should look for when it comes to MongoDB injection. So first, let me let me show the databases. Um, I have an injection database uh, or installed, so I'm going to use the injection database. Then I have a collection called, and let me just show you the actual data that I have here. So there is a collection called accounts, and I have five fields in them. I'm going to inject a password by simply looking it up. So MongoDB has a, a concept of filtering when you do a find. And this is what you would use when you input in trusted data. If I were to find a, a username, for instance, and I wanted to look at a user one, then what I would do is I would find the username and I would look up user one. 
And filtering is really as simple as that. So you can see here, I've filtered the command and I just have user one. And that's how a, a traditional application would actually work. But what if I were to change this and make this a comparison operator? So I make it greater than, and I want a username to be greater than nothing. And you can see here, now I get everything. And what we're doing when we do NoSQL injection is we are taking the untrusted data or what you would input into a, an application and we put something like this. Now, this is really easily defeatable in an application. All you would have to do is uh, do some input validation for the dollar sign or these colons here. And you wouldn't be able to actually inject. However, what you'll see is that NoSQL injection as a whole is, is being attributed to a marketplace and not a database itself. So in this example, you can see MongoDB is allowed to inject when it's doing a comparison of greater than because it uses collation concepts on a string. And the collation concepts are really just how do you quantify in some way a, a string value? Um, and in the slides, we'll link out to that if you'd like to learn more. But I think as an industry, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Um, by claiming that NoSQL injection is an attack vector, what we're doing is putting our defense teams on a broad alert for specific patterns. And every NoSQL database has a different command and query structure. And it's really dependent on the database because there are hundreds on the market. And no longer do we have a structured query language that is propagated throughout the industry. So I personally think that because NoSQL means not only SQL and it's not a structured query language, we shouldn't attribute an entire marketplace to have an injection profile. I think it would be more efficient as our defensive teams and those developing security solutions to say, this is something that is attributable to Mongo. This is a, something that is attributable to Couchbase. This is something that's attributable to Redis. And as a whole, I think the market is assigning NoSQL injection as a very holistic thing. So how do we prescribe solutions to real issues the right way? Um, instead of branding them to raise awareness it is one of my first challenges to you throughout the industry. The second challenge throughout the industry is how to think of the cloud database market as a whole. So what you'll see is that there's now a cloud database for every open source solution. Um, and that's propagated throughout Google Cloud, that's propagated throughout Azure, that's propagated throughout AWS. And a lot of open source vendors, um, my own company included, have cloud managed services. And you can see some of those on the screen we're asking different questions. So we're very used to asking about SQL injection, no SQL injection, if TLS exists. But there are other things that we don't consider, like how do we prevent vendor login? What if we want to switch cloud providers? What if we want to move and do backups? And what if we want to ensure that our databases are being handled the right way? These are things that I think are, are broadly overlooked in the database market today. There's also a concept of poison pills. So if you're looking at a streaming solution, there's the concept of a consumer and a producer uh, along a stream. So when you think of Kafka, you're going to think of a producer, say an IoT device sending data to a Kafka stream. In AWS, this is probably best known as Kafka Fi or AWS Firehose. And then you have consumers, which are really just servers that are querying that stream looking for specific data. Your consumer is then going to take that data, send an acknowledgement, and say, I now have this data. But there's something called a poison pill. And 
a poison pill is data that's bad that doesn't work with your application and could potentially break it. And there are several ways that we can solve this. Um, you can send it to a dead letter queue, which is basically a, a queue for manual processing later. You can throw an error and shut down an application. But this is one of the things that I've never heard in the security market. Is we were asked the question, how are we handling poison pills within an application? And this is something that I think as a marketplace we need to start to consider because as a as an industry as a whole, we're very used to prescribing different things. And now that the industry is changing, we need to we need to think about use cases and how they're transforming and how architectures change today. One of the other things I think we need to do is look through the lens of distributed systems. And to do this, I want to talk to you about the CAP theorem. The CAP theorem says that in the event of a partition tolerance of a partition, either through a network or a server outage, you can either have consistency or availability. Now, a consistency, for those of you who aren't familiar, is simply if I input that x equals 5, and then query X, I'm always going to get the answer five. Availability is simply, if I need to access my database, am I going to be able to access it? And partition tolerance is in the event of a, a failure event, is my database still going to function? And a lot, CAP theorem as a whole is governed in many distributed systems by consensus algorithms. So that's why you see the concept of master slave in Kubernetes, in MongoDB, and in Redis, and in many databases in the industry today. And Raft and Paxos are the primary consensus algorithms that are used. Now, I'm not going to go into these because they're holistic talks in themselves. But I think it's really interesting and things that you should look into. But leader election is something that is very consistent. So I want to go at the super high level into what leader election is. And if I were to maintain a quorum within a cluster of databases, and say I have three databases, and one goes down in a partition tolerant database, that means that you're still going to be able to access the database some way. And in this example, if node two goes down, you'll still be able to, the database will still be able to function because it can maintain and understand the data within the two existing nodes. And the nodes are still able to maintain quorum, which is essentially an accurate record of this is the data, and this is what I think exists within my database. But we're asking the wrong questions when we think about distributed systems in the database market. So very frequently, what I see is people patching databases and putting reboot cycles in place. But what's happening is because all of these databases are associated with one application, they're rebooting them all at once. That really defeats the purpose of an AP system, because if you reboot them all at once, then you're going to lose quorum, because you need at least two votes in order to still be able to access your database. Um, and, and I laugh because that's a very frequent problem that I see. The other thing that I, I don't think people are considering is, do they have the right level of nodes in their cluster to maintain quorum and availability? And we can't forget, as cybersecurity professionals, the CIA in the CIA triad that we're all taught, availability is one of the one of the members of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So I think when we design systems and when we review systems, quorum main maintenance and the ability to maintain it is something we should really consider when we do our patching cycles, and when we do system design work. Another thing that I think we have to consider is, do we value consistency or availability? So like I said in the CAB theorem, you can only pick one. So we need to select databases based on those values. 
we also need to think, how do I best achieve disaster recovery? Now, many people are used to achieving disaster recovery through a backup. And they think, do I need to back up my system a specific way and what interval? And am I doing an incremental or full backup in my strategy? But replication is also a backup strategy now too. If a node goes down in, in an available and partition tolerant system, that system is still available. We also need to think, can my database support geographic replication? If an availability zone goes down, how am I going to ensure that as an organization, my database will still function? And what level of durability am I getting in a clustered system? So in a clustered system, you write to one cluster, one member of a cluster, and then that write is going to propagate to the other members. However, if the member that you write goes down, what happens? Does the other, do the other two members have the ability to support that write? And there are systems in place that support some level of write concern, which will monitor how many systems that replication event has processed. So do at least two of my databases have the write data? And how am I able to contain a, dur a durable write? In terms of authentication, uh, something I think we all need to think about is, do I trust the nodes in my cluster? Is a rogue slave able to authenticate and become part of my cl cluster? And how do nodes in my cluster authenticate among each other and ensure that they're trusted? Do I implement a TLS authentication strategy? Do I implement a password authentication strategy? Or am I using some form of IP restrictions and port restrictions in order to ensure that a rogue slave isn't able to become part of my cluster and then by, by nature be elected as a leader. And encryption is something that I think we also need to think about. So many people ask about client server encryption, but there's also forms of server to server encryption. And we also need to think, are my backups secure and encrypted? So these are things that I think we need to consider when dealing with distributed systems. And many security professionals aren't used to in the database market. So to use replication as an example, and when I talk about secure replication, imagine you are always going to write to a primary or a master in a distributed system. That primary here is then going to replicate to the two secondaries. If uh, a secondary, if that primary were to ever go down, the secondaries are going to elect one of the others as a primary. So when I talked about write concern, we want to know that that primary write has gone to the secondary, so that when one of the secondaries is now the the node being written to, that we have the appropriate data. And what I see in the marketplace is that this is something that security teams don't concern themselves with, but maybe they should. So what are the trends that I think we need to support? And what are the trends that are here to stay? So we have cloud native databases. Now databases are managed by all of the major cloud providers, by open source companies, and they're abstracted for simplicity and complexity. I think these have a value proposition. And that value proposition is simplicity. There's no way for a security team to understand holistically every configuration detail that needs to happen within a database and, and how that changes between database to database. I think the use of cloud providers, whether it be your AWS, Azure, or an open source company, is really powerful because they help abstract that for teams and reduce the complexity of having 100 different use cases. We also have the ephemeral secrets management trend. I think that's really powerful. And uh, that companies like HashiCorp and CyberArk are here to stay because of that. We also have a lot of teams using MFA for admin. And that's not to say a service account admin. That is to say a, a user admin. So what I see in the marketplace is that Many administrators in a large organization are using a secondary account to their primary ID. And 
and then that idea is being backed up and rotated continuously. And that's done by solutions like CyberArk and HashiCorp, and ephemeral secrets management is the same. So what is ephemeral secrets management? And this is an example from HashiCorp. Well, first an admin is going to enable uh, a database secret engine. That secret engine is then going to have some form of a policy. And that policy says I'm going to rotate my password at X interval. My password needs to be this complex. And this is what a, a secret and a role is allowed to do. They're going to configure it and create roles that are used by applications. Then an application is going to then use that set of a set of credentials to access a vault. They're going to be returned with a specific credential to access a database with a, a time to live and, and ask if that's renewable or not. And then they're going to access their database. Now this does come up with a performance hit, but what it does do is ensure that the, the simplicity it ensures the simplicity of password rotation. And a lot of compliance teams very frequently ask for password rotation. They actually have a friend who's running a whole project dedicated to password rotation of databases across an entire industry or an entire conglomerate organization. And value propositions like ephemeral, ephemeral secrets management really ensure that applications don't have to take an outage every time they have to change a password. Um, and what's new and exciting in the market? So we had Forstanix and Azure talk about secure enclaves. Um, my company is also looking into secure enclaves. Um, there's an open source Redis database that supports secure enclaves that is on the Azure marketplace on confidential compute. And I, I think that there's also Microsoft SQL always encrypted in the market today. And what we're seeing is that a lot of people are starting to care about encryption and use. And while there still isn't a compliance framework that mandates this, a lot of organizations are staking their brand on security. And they think that encryption and memory is here to stay. So today, their traditional way of doing encryption and memory is through client-side encryption. And we saw Fortanix and, and, and Azure talk yesterday, or sorry, a few weeks back about how secure enclaves are going to enable the use of machine learning between parties. And they also allow you to change the trusted computing base in order to no longer have the administrator. But I think that there's a different value proposition to secure enclaves. And that's in the database market, people are using client-side encryption in order to support encryption in use. But one of the downsides of client-side encryption is that it limits comparison operators. So if I were to do a, a traditional SQL-like comparison operator, if I have client-side encryption done on my data, I won't be able to compare that data because it's encrypted and the database doesn't actually know it. Um, if I were to say do an incremental operator, then that also wouldn't work because a, a number now is perceived as a string value when client-side encryption is in place. And I think secure enclaves are going to be powerful because they also open up a realm of opportunities for those who are already using client-side encryption but want to open up new use cases. and. Runtime data masking is probably the other new and exciting thing that I see in the marketplace. So Microsoft SQL supports dynamic data masking. And HashiCorp just released a new transform, uh, transform product. And if you look at the transform product, it looks somewhat like this, where users are going in and using their application and sending uh, an actual sensitive data file or field to HashiCorp, which is then protected there the specific way that they want. Then HashiCorp is returning through transform a value that is masked. 
And then their users are baking into the are baking into their application a way to say role X does not have access to this data and will receive a masked value. And role Y will actually have access to this data. And we're seeing a whole new potential market of databases designing role-based masking through either external providers like HashiCorp or built in through Microsoft SQL emerging. And I, I think this is a powerful thing. I've seen a limited number of use cases, but that's my personal opinion. There's a whole market behind it. And I'm really excited to see where something like this goes. So I presented a lot of problems today in the market. And most of those revolve around the complexity of how the database market is transforming. So what can we do to solve this? So first, if you look at the CIS benchmarks today, uh, they support major providers. But major providers exist like Mongo, like Microsoft SQL, like Oracle. What you don't see is how to securely configure Kafka, how, you, how to securely configure Redis. And these are database providers in the market today that are widely deployed and in most organizations. But as a security team, how do we fill the skills gap? And many teams rely on the CIS benchmarks or vendor tools to understand how to do that. So I think as an organization, we need to start to support and bridge the gap between a, a CIS benchmark and a, an industry adoption of a solution because there is a gap that I feel the pain in the industry for. And in order to do that, we achieve the once we do that, we start to achieve the goal of starting with sane secure builds to reduce the complexity of security. Then moving to the cloud. Um, now, some people are still strictly against that, and that's okay. It's based on their organization's policy. But I really think there's a value proposition for the complexity of different solutions that are on premise today when moving to the cloud. And that's because of the capability of self service and automated scanning or self service adoption of security tools. Um, no longer do you have to figure out how to do encryption at rest or encryption in transit. A lot of this is just a simple button click in the cloud. Uh, and I think that has a real value proposition in the market today. It, it'll help teams scale security. And also, I think another thing that we can do as an industry is transform the security persona from an auditor to a delivery stakeholder. Now, there's always going to be some room for an auditor. There has to be some form of separation of duties in the market. But having an aligned resource who's responsible for delivery will improve speed and have educated resources doing this configuration and have a stakeholder for security at the table of a solution design. And we see this a lot in Silicon Valley. We see this a lot in some industries, but we see other industries who still have the auditor persona very rampantly used throughout um, their security teams. And I think this is something that needs to change in the industry today. So let me round out by saying this is this is all my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of my company. And now at this point, I'd really like to open it up to some questions because at the end of the day, um, this is an independent community, and I think we need to have a, a conversation about where the industry is going and how the database market's taking us. So at this point, I want to throw it over to Oz and team and do a little Q&A. Uh, I have one question. Uh, so, uh, Jimmy, uh... What are the types of like attacks that you have seen uh, on the databases that's like either on the cloud or, you know? Uh, what is like the most common types of attacks and you know? How yeah. does uh, one like try to find this kind of vulnerabilities or something with respect to the databases exactly? 
Sure. So I, uh, I, I give this example really frequently, and, and let me pull it up. So uh, one of the things that really bothers me is that throughout our industry, what I see is a, a ton of databases that are still exposed to the internet. I think mature, for mature organizations with security teams, this really shouldn't be an issue, but it still is. So I'll, I'll use my own database as an example, and I give this talk too much at this point. Um, but this is open source Redis. And when I look on Shodan, I still see the, the top example here is an unauthenticated Redis server and 15,000 ones throughout the internet. That's terrifying for me. Um, wow. Because, wow. <laughs> and if I were to say do MongoDB, um, that's 27071. What are these numbers? Um, this, this is the standard port number for the databases. I, I think that I don't remember if this is Oracle or Microsoft SQL, but it's one of them. Maybe, and you can see here, this is this is a Microsoft SQL server. It, it really hurts me that, that we're still exposing databases to the internet today, and a lot of these are unauthenticated. And I mean, we know here that most of these are uh, unauthenticated, and when we talk about a cluster database well, that the first thing I would do is I would add a database to a cluster and start scraping everyone's data. Or I would, these are prime brute force candidates. Um, one of the, I don't know if he's on, but there's, there's a security researcher who's really active in this community who will message me on the Silicon Valley security Slack about Redis crypto mining campaigns. And I really, I kind of laugh because people are exploiting uh, very known vulnerabilities that are mitigatable by just putting a password on the database. Um, and, and these campaigns are rampant. And it's very painful for me to to see that because a lot of organizations and open source databases are are now specifically putting countermeasures in place to say if you don't um, by default we're going to deploy in a in a mode where this database is only accessible on the local host. So in, in Redis, for instance, it comes with a protected mode where you have to turn off access to you have to turn off the mode in order to actually expose it to the uh, a remote host, <laughs> um, but we're still seeing and hearing a lot about crypto mining campaigns today. Yeah, uh, you see the realm of uh, your extremely secure government organizations and financial services that are talking about in memory encryption, and and then you see this. And as an industry, I think we have to fix both problems. Um, it's just a matter of time and education. I have a question, Jamie. Um, you, you mentioned that that there was a migration to uh, to cloud-based databases, and uh, I hear a lot about hybrid cloud, where where it's a mix of like a public cloud and then an on-premise server, uh, and there's likely synchronization between those two. Um, is there is there any potential for vulnerability there, and and where are the issues there? Um, so, in in terms of synchronization between multiple things, a public cloud and uh, an on-premise server, I, I really think it's your standard stuff. So is this, are the servers that are talking or replicating to each other authenticated? Are, are we encrypting the data? Is it over a private network? So um, say using a, a VPN between your on-premise database and the cloud database, or is it going over a public network? And I kind of see a, a broad range of these questions being asked when I talk to people. Good to know. That's things I see. Yeah, good, good to know. That that's cool. Um, I would think that if you had deployed that model, it would be by design that you would want to encrypt both the synchronization traffic and the and put it over a VPN. But um, I, I guess it doesn't surprise me that people don't do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we tend to fall into groupthink as an organization. 
because we're all security professionals here. To, to a lot of us, this is common sense. Um, but as you can see, when I look at Shodan, it's the common sense doesn't apply everywhere. Clearly not, no. <laughs> um, that's why I think our, our job should really be to educate the community. Um, we, we like to talk about the cool technical things like Intel SGX and AMD memory production, but I mean, those are the, the technologies that are super advanced to where sometimes we're talking about basic hygiene that's still needed. I'm still surprised that most DB installs don't send the random passwords by default, he says. Um, yeah, so, so when I look at the market today, I, I see a lot of uh, databases not sending random passwords by default, but what they're doing is they're implementing a, a, a local host exception. So what that means is that say I were to install a Mongo database or a Redis database, and I'm going to use both of those examples because it's similar. Um, but what they're doing is they're deploying a, a policy that says you need to turn something off in order to access the database from a remote host. And I, I laugh when some people do that because um, there's a crypto mining campaign that I've been following called Redis Wanamai. And that was using the Apache Struts remote code execution vulnerability and then exploiting um, databases via their local hosts that were on a public server. So it was, it was reasonably painful to see that. Um, but I think one of the patterns that I see very frequently is people using certificate authentication and not password authentication. And uh, that could potentially be a reason why you don't see the holistic market. Um, but that's something interesting that I think I'll have to talk to my peers about the considerations. So uh, Jamie has one last question. So any, uh, do you have any resources, like you know, somebody who is just venturing into like database security and you know, things like that? Do you have any good resources that you could suggest? Yes and no. Um, so I, I think one of the problems with database security holistically is there are so many different databases in the market that mm -hmm. usually people, I would refer people to a CIS benchmark and say, hey, this is a, a good configuration guide. Um, but what you'll see is that the CIS benchmark really only has some relational databases. Um, last I checked, and I could be wrong here, there, there was a draft benchmark for Hadoop for a long time. And um, what I'd like to see is members of the industry uh, step up and help uh, collaborate to fix this problem. Okay. Um, I, I see some people, some people doing it, others not. Um, but I think it's just a skills gap that we're working to solve at this point. Um, the OWASP has a good, OWASP has a good guide, um, but it doesn't cover a reuse case. And I think OWASP and the CIS benchmarks are good places to start but they won't get everything. Um, vendor documentation is your next best after that. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, any other questions? Any comments? See what I'm seeing on the comments chat section. Everybody is super happy about the talk. and Everybody's uh, super interested, definitely. Thank you so much again, Jamie. -opening it was an eye-opening talk for most of us. Anytime, guys. Catch you guys in the next meetup.